My talk will be about the Internet of Value and Bitcoins. I don't know, anyone in the audience is familiar with Bitcoins and blockchain technology? Raise your hands, please. Ah, I see some of them, see? And now, who of those who have heard of Bitcoin are a bit skeptical about it? See, yeah, you're kind of my kind of audience. I think it's exactly the same thing. The first thing I heard about Bitcoin, I would think about Tazos or Flippos, as we call them in the Netherlands, useless coins with no value whatsoever. But I was wrong, and I'll tell you why. Seven years later, there are 10 million Bitcoin people, Bitcoin users. There's 10 million people that are really excited about Bitcoin, and where do you are, where, wherever you are in the world, you will always find some of them close to you. 10 million people, just think about those 10 million people. How much is that, really? Well, if you look at a country like Switzerland, we've got 8 million Swiss people on this planet who, in total, have like 65 billion euros worth of Swiss francs floating around here in their economy. Even though Bitcoin is still very small, um, the number of users is comparable to the amount of Swiss people on this planet. And we've been able, as a Bitcoin community, to make Bitcoin be worth 15 billion euros. 15 billion euros for an open soft source software program that hasn't existed for that long is, well, in my opinion, pretty amazing. Because it took the Swiss 727 years to build this wealth. Well, that's it. Now you hear it. Bitcoin, only eight years. After eight years, it's worth 15 billion euros. So this is why I thought I'd have to give, uh, I have to give Bitcoin another chance. So to understand this whole new Bitcoin thing and the internet of value, one must learn you know, what is the internet. How do we see the internet? As you can see in the picture above, or somewhere on the screen, is that this the map of the world with 1.3 billion connected devices. This map was generated by a, a botnet called uh, Karna a few years ago. It was illegally sourced. It scanned every single router and, and computer it could find on the internet only to create this pretty picture. To understand the this presentation, we have to make a distinguish. We have to distinguish between the different types of internet we we're familiar with. First, most of us will be familiar with the Internet of Information. It's the World Wide Web as we know it. Some say technology is the campfire around which we tell our stories, but I, I totally disagree with that. It's this Internet of Information which is actually the campfire around which we tell our stories. It's based on the World Wide Web, and most of your apps connecting, you know, most of your apps on your phone connecting to the web use the World Wide Web or the HTTP protocol that powers this Internet of Information. Then we make a distinguishment in the Internet of Things, things like your, your router, your Wi-Fi hotspot, but also your, your smart meter, your thermostat, and even your, 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 your new battery-operated Tesla is calling home to the factory every single day. These things, they are communicating without any user interaction. They're basically, they're just devices, you know, talking on the internet. And then we have a third type of internet, the internet of value. Unlike the internet of information, where we can like copy paste, copy paste, copy paste everything we like and see, the internet of value works differently. So generally, they're blockchain based. Uh, cryptocurrencies, which sounds really complicated, just drop it for now. But it's this new technology will will uh, makes it possible to prevent double spends. That means if I have a token, in this case a Bitcoin, and I send it to you or you or anyone in the audience, I no longer have the token. I can no longer I can copy the token, but I can't spend it again. This is something really unique because for the first time in the history of mankind, we've got something that's one digital. And at the same time, it's scarce. So it's also limited in supply. So it shares a bit of the correct characteristics with money. So in that, in that respect, we, we, we have a totally new system to, um, to do transactions on. But to understand why we need an internet of value, first have to understand why, how we pay on the internet nowadays. Well, most people will use a credit card. Uh, it's the easiest way, but um, as you can see, to understand the credit card payment system, you have to understand a bit, have a look at, at one of the credit card numbers. As on screen, you see a um, credit card number of which the first four digits, 4916, they represent a Visa card. 
The next four digits, 6530, represent a Bank of Belize uh, card. That's a, a real bank in Belize City, Belize. The last eight digits represent an account number. Account number could be anything, really. Uh, the, the CVV code, which is like the, the, the code you see on the back of your card, that's been added later because it was a broken system and they thought, you know what, we'll make it more secure by just adding a few extra numbers, which makes no sense whatsoever, but they tried it. Two and a half billion people. This is the amount of people that no, don't have a credit card. They don't have a card. They can't pay on the internet. They're basically excluded from global commerce. And for them, the internet is like one big brochure with all these wonderful products they can't have. And not only unfair, it would make me really miserable if I would be one of those two and a half billion people. So in order to change this, we have to either get them a bank account or have to find a solution. Well, Bitcoin has a solution. Because with Bitcoin, we no longer need a bank account. You generate your own bank account number. As you can see on screen, this address in the back, it's a long address, but it starts with a one, and then TED, TED, X, and then it follows the rest, is a Bitcoin address. You can transfer funds to that address. To create such an address, you just start your phone or your, your, your computer, and you, you open your Bitcoin wallet, and it will generate one of those addresses for you. So anybody who just starts an app and creates an address, will be able to receive money this way. Well, to spend it, it's a little bit different. To spend it, you need a private key. Here's an example of the private key. So basically, your private key is what you use to spend your bitcoins, while you receive your bitcoins on the public key. They're both linked together. So this is basically your bank account. Don't worry about the QR codes too much. They're, they're, they're like, just, they make my eyes hurt. Uh, but, um, we thought, you know, if, if Bitcoin is banking without banks, then who's going to keep your Bitcoin safe? I mean, really. What I did at first is I would print those Bitcoins on a QR code and would bring them to the bank, basically to a safe deposit box. I would rent a safe deposit box at the bank. And to be honest, okay, I felt defeated every time I went to the bank because where we are going, we don't need no banks. So still I was there with my QR code in an envelope going to my bank safe. So in order to change it, we thought, let's shrink this QR code. Let's shrink it down to a tiny little chip implant, 11 millimeters large, a little tiny little antenna chip, and encase it in a glass cap capsule. And then we can inject it into our hands so we should always store our Bitcoin safe near us. So this is what we did, and if you take an X-ray photo, it looks something like this. Uh, it's, it's, it basically, I've got my left and my right hand. I put a little chip in, and I use them for things like Bitcoin, of course. But I use them as, to snooze my alarm in the morning. I use them as my passwords. You can use them to open an apartment door. There's many, many, many different applications. But for me, the most important one was just create a modern-day equivalent of a Belize bank account. So instead of having the bitcoins on a far away, or sorry, your, your cash and your finances on a far away bank account, you can now store them in bitcoin in your hands and take them wherever you go. Before you think you get any funny ideas, they're encrypted, so there's no point chopping any hands off or anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At the time, we were, we were thinking, like, we were just designing our second Bitcoin ATM at the time, and the first one, we the first model we designed, you know, was nice success. So we, we started with the second model, and one of the engineers said, "You know what? If you could just like wave your hands to get cash out, wouldn't that be fantastic?" I said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, let's do that." But if you would like wave your hands and then put some money in, so you could charge your card or your chip implant. So yeah, that's great, except that we don't have a market for that. There's nobody has a chip implant. So we decided we had to modify the machines a bit and make it easier for the user to understand. Just like that Bitcoin ATMs is not really an ATM. An ATM is usually, it's usually operated by a bank. And since people are their own bank with Bitcoin, there is no bank they connect to. So the ATM is more like a portal to the internet of value. It directly connects to an exchange, allows people to do all those transactions without really knowing how complicated it all is in the background. It's for them, the, the metaphor of an ATM is something they feel comfortable with. And for the same reason, we decided 
to make the chip implants, to just put them on a card. Because we all, we all com comfortable with a bank card. Piece of plastic, you know, we, we know it has value and that you need to protect it if it has value. So this is why we modified the ATM and created a separate like card dispenser. So it will work just like the implants without the implants. So this is like for the rest of us that really don't want to get the chip implant, just get your card from an ATM. This makes it extremely flexible for, for, for a loyalty program, micropayments, just mobile wallets, or to keep your savings. The card itself, Although it looks like a boring card, this, this, this one has a TEDx design, but they can be, be customized in any design. But the whole point is, there's no cardholder name on that. It's not some access to a bank account stored elsewhere. Instead, it is your bank. You can store multiple accounts on there, and you can decide when and who you want to pay. There's nobody, but nobody that will be able to block you from making your transaction. Basically, the way money should work, really. Besides, you know, once you've got your card or your chip implant, created, like we thought, you know, we had to spend our money somewhere. So we created this uh, Cortex Pay, which is our point of sale offering. And Cortex Pay basically allows you to just swipe your hands and pay for your, for your pie or your coffee or your dinner in an easy way, in a modern way, like, like a normal payment terminal, except without the bank cards, without the bank. There's no bank. There's still no bank. And we thought it would be a cool idea to actually, if we would like, enable vending machines to, to, to accept these bitcoins, because then the, then the vending machines could manage their own wallets, and they would be able to, to report to the owner how much, the, how much stock they have, whether they need refilling, there would be no coins, could get away, get rid of the coins. So we created this, um, well, it was a soda, fizzy soda drink machine, and we converted it to run on Bitcoin, and yes, you can wave your hands and just, um, just get your Bitcoin, or sorry, just get your fizzy drink this way. Who is familiar with this error message? Anyone serving the web? 404 page not found exactly. Do you know, did you know that it's, it's, it's been included in the World Wide Web actually since day one? The 404 page not found error is really part of the HTTP protocol. And it's, it's important to know that it will not only tell the end user that the, the information could not be found, but more importantly, in the header of the page, just before you see the whole page, it will tell your browser or your, your client, it will, tell, it will tell machines, basically, that the page is not found and that there is no page at that location. This enables search engines to, um, this enables search engines to actually learn and see that a page is no longer there so they can remove it from their index. This is a sort of mechanism, the way how, how the World Wide Web works. But what most people don't realize and don't know is that there's also payment, or sorry, error 402, payment required. If you look in the official spec, it says, for future implementation. But honestly, that was written 27 years ago. There's more than a quarter, quarter of a century ago. And the original idea was for the web to have a payment system, to have a way that, for example, if you would visit this sponsored page, and you would look at this commercial, that in return for watching, or for, in return for your time, you would get some micro-credits, micro-payments. Unfortunately, with the current state of payment systems on the internet, this is impossible. All those credit cards and PayPal and Apple Pay and whatever, whatever comes up, they're always layered on top of the existing banking system. A system which is very susceptible to fraud, really. Uh, because people can just create their own credit card number using a card generator, or they might be able to um, th th they might be able to do payments online, but they won't be able to do micro payments online because most banking systems struggle with payments smaller than one cent. So for this reason, Bitcoin would be the great equalizer, or more more, more bet better better put. Um, cryptocurrencies in general, so Bitcoin, any blockchain technology would basically help to enable a payment layer for the World Wide Web. Because once we enable this payment layer for the World Wide Web, websites offering a product for sale will be able to tell machines how much this product would cost. So the vending machines of the future and the self-driving taxi of the future will actually be able 
to make decisions from, for themselves. Not only share information like they do on the World Wide Web or on the Internet of Things, but actually be part of our economy. So if we have a self-driving taxi of the future, the self-driving taxi of the future will be able to pay for its own charge at the end of the night. And if somebody tips, it will be able to maybe afford itself a whiff of fresh car scent next time it's at the, at the, at the weekly car wash. Or the self, you know, the autonomous vending machine of the future might be able to search the web for deals and special prices if on, on certain products if it needs refilling. Or it might be able to use deep learning algorithms and to decide that it wants to have a slight change in its, in its products. These things are currently impossible because the web needs a payment layer. And for this to succeed, I, I, I would suggest that we look at the World Wide Web. It's been 27 years since it was invented. We, it changed the way we work, drink, or eat, play. And it totally changed the way we live. So for the next generation of the web to succeed, we need to give it the payment layer. It really asked for since the day it was founded, really. And for all those others, Next time you hear Bitcoin, don't be like me and think about the crazy Tazos or Flippos. Have a good look at it. It's really worth your time. Maybe get a, get a few euros and purchase yourself some Bitcoin, spend them to your neighbor, um, buy something pretty for it and save the rest for later because it might be the best investment you've ever made. Thank you. This is, this is my talk. Yeah.